Okay, well, this morning we're looking at five verses uh, from Galatians chapter 3. And the reason why we're looking at just five is we'll find these five are very full. Uh, but what follows is much more than we'd be able to handle in, in one sermon, especially if we look at these things as well. But what <clears throat> Paul says in this passage this morning is very, very important. We have everything that has to do with the gospel contained here. And uh, Paul is simply going to remind us that if we try to earn our salvation by our works, we'll be cursed or remain under that curse. But Jesus has taken that curse for everyone who will trust in Him. Um, and so he reminds us as well that really that has always been the only way of salvation. We may get a different impression when we read the Bible. We need to understand our impression was wrong. Okay? No one was ever saved by their works. God never gave us a system of works by which to save ourselves. The law given by Moses, the ceremonial law, was simply meant, as Paul's going to tell us later, not in our text, but it was all meant to teach us of our need of Christ, of Jesus Christ and His sacrifice. So, Galatians 3, 10 through verse 14. Paul says, For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. Now that no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous man shall live by faith. However, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, he who practices them shall live by them. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. For it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree, in order that in Christ Jesus the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles, so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Well, may the Lord bless this part of His Word to our, our understanding this morning. Okay, so remember uh, that Paul has been mounting a polemic. A polemic is, is an, usually considered an in-house argument. Apologetic is what you would use to defend the Christian faith against unbelievers. These Judaizers really were unbelievers, but the Judaizers, I, I, you know, again, who were they? Well, they were Jews who taught that Gentiles uh, needed to believe in Christ. So did Jews. You know, He is the promised Messiah. Um, but that Jesus isn't enough, okay? His perfect life, His atoning death was not enough to justify us. By the way, I'm going to use that word a lot. Justif justification means that God sees us as, as absolutely pure, no guilt, and as having done absolutely everything right. That's the only way we can be acceptable to Him, okay, is if we are guiltless and we are perfectly righteous. And by the way, having your sins canceled out does not make you righteous, it makes you neutral. So Jesus had to cancel out our sins, we had to be forgiven, but He also had to obey so He could give us a positive record of obedience. So that's what justification is. Now, the Judaizers did believe that Jesus didn't really do what was needed to make us acceptable to God. I'm beginning to think, and I haven't seen any commentators see this, maybe they were still looking to Him as a political Messiah and not as a Savior from sin. But they believed that we still needed to be Jews, okay, that we needed to be circumcised and we needed to observe the Mosaic traditions, the Mosaic law. The Jews needed to continue to be Jews and follow their Jewish traditions, and Gentiles needed to become Jews. See, that's what Judaizer means, is a Jew who makes somebody else Jewish, okay? Judaizes them, so to speak. So in other words, what they were teaching was that there are things we need to do, works that we needed to add to God's grace through Jesus Christ, to be justified. Now, we already saw what Paul thought about this. This is the destruction, the utter destruction of the gospel. He says because it nullifies, it cancels out God's grace. To add any works to grace is to destroy grace absolutely. Okay? The, the two are mutually exclusive, and we're going to see more about that uh, this morning. 
So because of the danger the Galatians were in of abandoning the gospel, I mean, Paul says, I'm, I'm, I'm shocked, I'm surprised you're so quickly abandoning the gospel. For this other teaching that is not a gospel, uh, Paul set aside his usual prayer of thanksgiving and immediately set out to condemn those who would bring a false gospel. And he even wrote this, which is amazing. He says, even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to what we have preached to you, he is to be accursed. I mean, even if we came and changed our minds and started going against what we've already told you. Now, this, this clause, he is to be accursed, can be translated in various ways. Let him be accursed. Let him be under God's curse. He must be accursed. And the reason is because those who teach this are destroying the only way to escape God's curse for our sins, which is only through what Jesus Christ has done. So having set the tone for the letter, Paul went on to refute the Judaizers' claims one by one. They said, first of all, Paul had received his gospel from the other apostles in Jerusalem, but Paul had distorted it. He was teaching a false gospel. This is what the Judaizers were saying. Well, Paul's reply was he didn't receive it from the apostles. He received it directly from Jesus Christ when he was on the road to Damascus. Remember how the Lord converted him? He didn't even see another apostle for three years. And even then, he didn't talk to them about the message that he was preaching until 14 years later, so 17 years now altogether, when he finally goes to Jerusalem and compares his gospel to theirs. And this is at the Jerusalem Council. And he found it was the same. And that was good for them because Paul would have taken them to task, you know, it almost appears in Galatians that Paul submits his gospel, for, he says, for fear that I had run in vain. It almost looks like Paul's doubting his gospel, but he's not. He's doubting whether the apostles are actually preaching the true gospel, and if they're not, he was afraid they were messing up what he was doing. So Paul would have taken them to task because he knew this gospel he had received was the true gospel. Well, then Paul went on to relate what happened when Peter, you know, one of the pillars of the church in Jerusalem came to Antioch, which was the center of Gentile Christianity, and how he withstood him to his face and rebuked him for his siding with the Judaizers, which is what Peter actually did when he was eating with the Gentiles, and then the Jews from James and Jerusalem came up to Antioch, and then Paul began to withdraw from the Gentiles. He was essentially saying the Judaizers are right. Well, Paul publicly rebuked him for siding with them. And he said, if you're right, Peter, if the Judaizers are right, not only has Jesus led you and me into sin by teaching us a false gospel, but his death on the cross was actually for nothing. If we can justify ourselves through our own works, then why do we need Christ? Well, that, that brings us up to where we were last week. And again, that was a brief review where Paul gives us several more arguments of why it must be by faith. You know, receiving uh, this righteousness we need to be justified comes by trusting in Christ. He said, first of all, that Jesus died, the fact that he was crucified, means that he had to die. He had to die because our obedience could never be enough. The alternative to that line of thinking, he said, is that Jesus died for nothing and that is unthinkable. Second, he reminded the Galatians how it is they receive the Holy Spirit. That's the blessing of Abraham. That's the evidence that we really trusted in Jesus Christ. And remember in those days, it came in two different ways. People would, well, they trust in Jesus for one thing. They'd love him. That was the sign the Spirit was given to them. But they would speak in tongues, something we don't believe continues to the present. But how did they receive the Spirit? The one who gives life the one who shows them and convinces them that they are accepted by God by giving them the confidence to cry out, Abba, Father. Well, he says it wasn't through circumcision. It wasn't through keeping the Mosaic traditions. You didn't receive the Spirit that way. It wasn't through any system of works, but it was by hearing with faith. You received the Spirit when you heard the gospel. The Spirit quickened you, and you trusted in Christ. Christ. 
Well, okay, so that came by hearing with faith. Thirdly, if they received the Spirit through the gospel, if that's the way they did so that they trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ and they were accepted by God, are they now going to turn back to something that could not give them acceptance with God, turn back to the law to somehow complete this justification? Well, if it couldn't help them before, it's not going to help them now. And then fourthly, he said, what about all the suffering that you endured? at the hands of your Jewish neighbors for trusting in Christ. Was that all for nothing? Well, of course not. You know, Jesus suffered at the hands of his own people by preaching the gospel. And Paul said, all who live godly, all who live like Christ will also suffer persecution. The fact that you did suffer shows that you actually are becoming more like Jesus Christ. I mean, that's the evidence that you have the Spirit and that you are born again. So it wasn't for nothing. God is showing you. You belong to Him. And then fifthly, Paul's message was confirmed by miracles. That's how the Lord authenticated His messengers in those days, remember, and had these Judaizers performed any miracles? Did God authenticate them? No. What does that say about their message? Well, it's not from God, but ours is, he said, because God worked miracles through us to confirm the message that we gave to you. That is God's message. And then finally, Paul pointed to the great Old Testament example of justification, the one every Jew would respect and the Judaizers should as well, Abraham. How was Abraham accepted? How was he justified? Well, Abraham believed God. He believed his promise that through the seed, through his seed, one of his offspring, one of his children, all the nations would be blessed. And Abraham believed God, and God credited it to him, reckoned it to him as righteousness, not his faith as an act of obedience, but rather the righteousness of the seed who was coming to him, the only righteousness by which we might be saved. He looked through faith, he looked forward, he saw the fulfillment of God's promise, he trusted Christ, and he was declared just. Justification, even for the Jews, okay, has always been through faith in the Messiah, not through the law. And Paul is arguing the same is true of Gentiles. We are all saved through faith in Christ. Now, this morning, Paul continues to argue that the only way we can be justified, accepted, saved is through faith in Jesus Christ, and this time he shows us because Christ alone has removed the curse. He's the only one who can take it from us. You know, again, we're under the curse when we come into this world, the broken covenant of, that Adam broke. We're under the curse of death, eternal death. Christ is the only one who can take that curse away. So first of all, he begins by saying, if we, again, seek to be justified by keeping the law, through our obedience, we will fail and remain under the curse. Verse 10, he writes, For as many as are of the works of the law are under a curse, for it is written, Cursed is everyone who does not abide by all things written in the book of the law to perform them. Now, I've already told you he's quoting here from Deuteronomy 27, verse 26, where Paul writes, Cursed is he who does not confirm the words of this law, by doing them, okay? Remember, God is holy. He wanted the Israelites to remember that if they were to live in His presence, if He was going to, you know, tabernacle among them in the tabernacle, His presence was there, they must be holy, okay? They must obey. And He's saying, if you want to dwell with God, you must obey absolutely. Now, I already told you, we don't have time to explore what this meant for Israel as a nation, their covenantal holiness, and how it was preserved by their outward obedience and their sacrifices so that the Lord was willing to live among them even though the majority of them were unconverted, but rather we need to see the sense in which Paul is quoting this passage this morning. This passage stands as a challenge to anyone who would try to earn their righteousness through obedience to the law. To avoid the curse of breaking it we have to be absolutely perfect. Now, can we do that? <laughs> can we be perfect? Not since the fall, right? 
You know, it occurred to me, and this is a debated point, but Jonathan Edwards argued that, that even before the fall, this wasn't possible. Adam and Eve demonstrated that it was impossible to earn a righteousness through the keeping of the law because they failed. Edwards believed the only one who could obey perfectly was Jesus, and he did that so that he might provide for us a perfect righteousness. But because of Adam's failure, we came into this world with a corrupt heart. Adam's sin not only made us guilty, but it made us evil. And so it wouldn't have mattered even if we could have obeyed God perfectly. We couldn't. But even if we could have, because we were already under the curse because of what Adam did, because of his decision on our behalf as our representative, as our covenantal head, when he sinned, Paul tells us in Romans 12, all of his offspring died. We all came under the curse. Now, not just the curse of the creation resisting us when we go out to work, you know, how it's going to yield thorns and thistles and all of that, but the curse of eternal condemnation, the curse of hell. Okay, we were born on our way to judgment. Remember how Paul says in Ephesians chapter 2 that we all walked according to the prince of the power of the air and we were children of wrath. That is, we were born under God's wrath and the only way to escape it was, of course, through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, Again, I want us to remember that Paul is not saying here that somehow we're neutral, and if we try to justify ourselves by the law, then we come under the curse. No, you know, we're already under the curse, you know, and trying to keep the law shows us that we are under the curse because it shows us our imperfections. You know how Paul said that he was once alive apart from the law, and then when the law came, sin became alive in him and he died? It didn't mean that he wasn't already guilty. It's just that he didn't realize he was guilty. It wasn't until he saw the commandment and realized he broke the commandment and he realized that I'm guilty and because I'm guilty, I'm dead. Well, that, that's what the law does. It, it teaches us what sin is so we can see that we've broken it and we're already under the curse. Now, Paul's going to tell us later that God never gave the law to the Jews as a way of salvation. He simply gave it to them to show them they could not save themselves. So it would drive them to the promise, the promise that God had been given, giving all the way through the Old Testament, the promise that He gave to Abraham, that of the coming Messiah. So we need to realize the same thing. God did not give us the law so that we could save ourselves. We cannot dig ourselves okay, out of the hole that Adam put us in since we've come into the world, we've only dug it deeper, right? We're, we're, we've gone down further because we've added sin upon sin through our own disobedience. But God gave us the law to show us that we are in the pit and that we can't save ourselves. So as long as we try to gain our acceptance through our obedience, we remain in the hole and we remain under that curse. So the second point is this, Paul then points to Scripture to remind us that the righteousness that we need to be justified, to be accepted, does not come from our works, but it comes through faith. Verse 11, now that no one, no one is justified by the law before God is evident, for the righteous man shall live by faith. Now here he's quoting Habakkuk 2 verse 4. The same verse he used to set his theme for the, the letter to the Romans, which says this, Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him, but the righteous will live by his faith. And what he's saying here is, not that I can make myself righteous by living by faith, but he's saying we gain, we can only gain the righteousness we need to be justified before God by faith, by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. So everyone who has ever been justified by God has been justified by faith and not by their works. By the way, there's one exception to that, and that is Christ. When He comes into the world and takes the obligation to obey the law on Himself, He actually does earn justification through His works, but He's the only one. We receive it by a gift of His grace, 
but the gift is of Christ's righteousness, what He earned for us if we trust Him. But again, the point here is no one has ever been saved, no one has ever been justified by their works. It's been only by faith. And again, he, he says in verse 6 what we saw last week, even so Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. So here's two passages from the Old Testament. The Old Testament saints were made righteous by looking forward to the Messiah who was coming. Adam and Eve, I believe Adam and Eve were saved, you know, after they fell and uh, before they were cast out of the garden, God made sacrifices for them through the animals and He clothed their nakedness with the skins. He set up the sacrificial system, which we see them doing early on. He put um, enmity between the woman and the serpent and her seed and his seed, which means that He redeemed Eve back to Himself and I believe Adam as well. But that only happened because they trusted in the promise that God gave, which is the seed of the woman would crush the head of the serpent, okay? So that was a promise regarding the Messiah. And by God's grace, they trusted in that Messiah and they were saved. So every believer, every true believer from Adam until Abraham were trusting in that promised seed that was coming. And then we see Abraham trusted in the seed God had promised through whom all the nations would be blessed. And everyone from him to Moses were saved by trusting in that seed. That's the same seed that would crush the head of the serpent. And then what was the Mosaic or the ceremonial law except one grand picture of the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ? Every Israelite who looked forward to the seed of Abraham through those promises, through those sacrifices, through those types and shadows by faith were justified by trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then when Jesus comes, what does He say? John 3.16, just a portion of, of that passage, whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. He's the fulfillment of everything the Old Testament was pointing to, and now He says, you need to trust in Me, you need to trust in Jesus Christ. So every Old Covenant saint and every New Covenant saint has been justified by trusting in Jesus Christ and in Him alone. Now, Paul is saying here that if it's true that the righteous man shall live by faith, that that's how we get the righteousness we need, by trusting in Christ. By God's grace as a free gift, it cannot be by works. That's how he begins verse 11, that no one is justified by the law before God is evident. How is it evident? The righteous shall live by faith. And in verse 12, the law is not of faith. On the contrary, he who practices them, the commandments, shall live by them. That's not faith. That's works. So Paul is simply saying justification, acceptance by God, the righteousness we need cannot come by the law and by faith. It's got to be one or the other. And he's arguing it must be by faith. And let's not forget works and grace are mutually exclusive. They are at opposite ends of the spectrum. They are opposites. So it's one or the other. It can't, it can't be both uh, and it can't be partly one and partly the other. It has to be one or the other. Paul says clearly everyone has always been justified only by trusting in Christ. And that's what grace is, okay, is where we get a free gift that we do not deserve, but rather we deserve the opposite. That's what grace is. God gives us something good that we do not deserve. So He gives us what Christ has done, that we do not deserve that, but we receive it by simply trusting in Christ, trusting in what He did, trusting in His death. So, those who try to earn their justification remain under the curse but those who trust Jesus receive the righteousness they need to be justified as a free gift of His grace. Okay, those are the first two points. Finally, Paul says this is only possible because Jesus took our curse on Himself. He writes in verse 13, Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us, for it is written, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. So when Jesus was on the cross, we know from, you know, uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, 
Uh, I think the last verse of the chapter says, He made Him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf, that we might become the righteousness of God in Him. When Jesus was on the cross, the Father imputed, He credited, He laid on Jesus the guilt of everyone who would ever believe on Him. Now, remember how this is pictured in the ceremonial law, what we just sang in, in that hymn, you know, my, my faith would lay her hands on that dear head of thine. How in the Old Testament, I've been reading Leviticus, how all these animals were sacrificed and the transferal of that guilt, you know, uh, how the Lord pictures us. Hands were laid on the sacrifices, transfers the guilt to the animal so that it might die in the offender's place. Well, Jesus took our guilt and the curse that was due for our guilt, which is eternal death, separation from God, hell, so that through His suffering, He might fully satisfy God's justice for us, take our curse, take it away, and give us the blessing instead. Now, Paul says that God showed us that this is what He was doing in the way that Jesus was crucified. I think it's an interesting point. Paul writes this, cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. That's why Jesus was, was executed in the way that he was executed. That's why at the time God sends his son into the world, crucifixion was the Romans' preferred method of execution. It's because God wanted to show the world that his son was becoming a curse for all who would trust in him, taking that curse from them and not because he was cursed by himself or on his own. One Bible commentator suggested this, which I thought was interesting, that when Paul, before his conversion, I mean, he, he was aware of Christ. He, he was in Jerusalem. I'm sure he was there, you know, rejoicing over the fact that, that this one he thought was a false Messiah was being executed. And when he saw Jesus on the cross, he was probably thinking, this shows that he was a false Messiah, that he is cursed of God because cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. But after his conversion, he realized that Jesus hung on that cross because he had become a curse for him. Okay, it was his curse that put Jesus there. Even as the curse that was upon us is what really brought the curse upon Jesus because the Father was willing to transfer that to him so that he might take it away, so he might do that for us. Well, one thing we don't want to miss as well is, even though Paul doesn't speak of it here, is that in taking this curse upon himself, Jesus not only removed it from us, for everyone who will trust in him, but he's removed it from the entire creation. You know, in Christ, all things are made new. So just as it doesn't yet appear what we're going to be like, it doesn't yet appear what the creation's going to be like, when Jesus returns to raise our bodies, to redeem them, and to bring in the new heavens and the new earth. The reason why there's going to be a new heavens and a new earth is because Jesus took the curse upon him. God is a God of reversals. You know, he creates a blessed world, and we changed all that through our sin, through Adam's sin, brought the curse upon the world. God reverses that by sending his son into the world to obey and die, that he might turn those things around and bring it back to the way it was before. That is what redemption is, is really all about. And we can argue it's going to be even better than it was originally. So the, again, to sum up everything we've seen, as long as we try to work our way to heaven, we remain under the curse that we're already under as we come into this world. But if we trust in Jesus Christ, we will be made righteous, acceptable to God through His righteousness, not through anything we earn as a free gift of His grace, and that's only possible because of what Jesus Christ did on the cross. Jesus became a curse for us. So that, as he says in verse 14, the blessing of Abraham might come to the Gentiles so that we would receive the promise of the Spirit through faith. Jesus takes our guilt and he gives us the Holy Spirit so that we might trust him and that we might love him and that we might become like him. So. He's done it all. So he gets all the glory. He gets all the credit for this. And we don't take any of the credit to ourselves. It's all of him. Uh, and the way that we show our thankfulness and our love to him 
is simply through our worship and our service in living the life He calls us to live, um, in the way Jesus lived, which if we have the Holy Spirit, that way is attractive to us, you know, because we want to be like Jesus. Well, let's bow for just a moment of prayer, and um, as, we, as we're praying, let's ask the Lord to uh, help us to trust in Christ and Him alone. But as we pray, let's also prepare to come to the table, uh, and in doing so, confess our sins to the Lord and renew our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and remember that it's only through His life and death that we are made acceptable to Him.